Chapter One of the Ghost Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. Chapter One What They Found in the Ice. We didn't often talk about crimes in our family not at least about the mysterious inexplicable crimes of violence that trumpeted their horrors at you every little while from the front pages of the papers when you have been there yourself have seen names you know and love pilloried there you know altogether too well how it feels to take an idle curious interest when the thing happens to someone else but this present mystery proved an exception it seemed so completely detached from all human motive so devoid of the usual accessories of grief and agony and shame that we found ourselves discussing it that night without reservation jack and gwendolen his pretty young wife and madeline and i if we discussed it with a sort of exaggerated nonchalance which showed that really in the background of all our minds that other mystery still lurked and cast its shadow the murder of the man who had been madeline's husband and jack's father i doubt if any outsider would have been able to detect it but geoffrey wasn't an outsider and he has the most amazingly sensitive perceptions of any man i know that is perhaps the reason why he can paint the way he can can open up the innermost recesses of character in those beautiful terrible canvases of his we weren't expecting him didn't know indeed that he'd come back from his two months vacation and you might have expected that our surprise and pleasure at the sight of him and the warmth of our greetings would have veiled everything else we were all trying to shake hands with him at once and patting him on the back demanding to know when he returned and why he didn't tell us in advance so that we gave him no chance to answer or even to take off his overcoat but instead of even trying to answer he stepped back and stood looking at us from one face to another and puckered up his eyebrows in a puzzled frown what in the world he asked have all you people been talking about nobody answered for a minute there was something almost uncanny about it madeline gave a little shiver jack's wife stood looking at geoffrey with that level thoughtful look of hers and finally said i'm glad i haven't any secrets could you keep your own do you think as well as you can read other people's i don't know said geoffrey it would be an interesting experiment to try but what a perfectly detestable character you're giving me i own i deserve it walking into a room full of people and asking them what they've been talking about you know perfectly well said madeline that in this household there never could be a wish to keep anything from you you've earned many times over the right to ask us what we have been talking about but in this case it wasn't a secret at all we were talking about the girl they found in the ice last month geoffrey looked puzzled found in the ice he questioned who you don't mean to say you haven't heard of it i cried the country's been ringing with it yes but i haven't been in the country said geoffrey i only landed late this afternoon went straight over to the atlas got my first fresh water bath in three weeks dined and came up here didn't even stop to read the evening papers you're looking pretty well i commented certainly a sight better than when you went away you had us all worried it was fearfully unmannerly of me said geoffrey to madeline to run off that way without a word but i suspect i did need a rest pretty badly i decided to go all in a minute the decorators were at work there in the studio and every time they pulled down a bit of loose plaster i went up in the air so at last i gave the key to my jap and fled 
sit down i commanded him and light a pipe and tell us all about it where you've been and what you've been doing jeffrey lighted a pipe obediently enough and settled down in the big chair which jack rolled round in front of the fire for him but then instead of beginning his odyssey as i had commanded him he smoked in silence for a minute then turned to gwendolen and asked what about the girl in the ice oh my adventures will keep he went on as i started to protest you will be hearing about them for the next six months a returned traveller's a nuisance anyway besides you've whetted my curiosity be a good chap and let mrs jack satisfy it it was natural that he should have turned to gwendolen for the story we all did that when we wanted the facts about anything her voice was so lovely in the first place that there was a sort of sensuous pleasure just in listening to her and then when gwendolen told it you knew it was so people have a way of talking about truth-telling as if it were simply a matter of good intentions you have told the truth unless you meant to be a liar and yet if you will stop to think you can probably call to mind half a dozen people who you know are honest and whom you wouldn't believe on oath and if you're a lawyer like me your difficulty will be the other way to think of half a dozen whose account of an occurrence you could believe absolutely and literally and without discounts or reservations well gwendolen would certainly head the list in my half dozen i don't know where you were two months ago gwendolen began and you may not have heard that we had a week of the coldest weather they have known here since they began to keep the records the thermometer stayed below zero for six days most of the time it was a long way below it came very suddenly so that the river which had been entirely open froze within that week over eight inches deep and the ice people began cutting six weeks ago an ice cutter at silver springs discovered a body frozen in the ice it was a girl a young woman somewhere in her twenties even in the pictures they took of her she was very beautiful and what must she have been really well one can imagine it because you see the body wasn't changed at all it had frozen just exactly as it was probably within a few hours after it had been put in the water been put echoed geoffrey then she hadn't drowned herself no said gwendolen it was murder she had been shot through the heart still interrupted geoffrey why murder why not suicide with the revolver and a tumble into the river it was murder said i for gwendolen had hesitated over the horror of the thing no powder marks around the wound i suppose suggested geoffrey shot fired from a distance i nodded how was she dressed he concluded he turned to gwendolen with that question that's one of the weirdest things about it said gwendolen she was in evening dress dressed as if for a ball and her hair perfectly wonderful hair it must have been from the picture was done that way too and they haven't identified her questioned geoffrey if the body was literally in perfect preservation it was said gwendolen you could even see the pressure marks of the rings on her fingers they said that points to robbery doesn't it said geoffrey she'd have worn her rings to the ball she hadn't been at the ball said gwendolen at least she wasn't in ball dress when she was murdered there was no bullet hole in the bodice of her gown and no stain of blood on the white satin they dressed her that way after she was killed so you see it wasn't robbery i can't help thinking gwendolen concluded that the murder was committed by some insane person because it doesn't seem that any one in his senses would have run that risk and taken that trouble to do what one would think must make the identification easier it is possible said geoffrey that if he'd read the weather report he wouldn't have done it 
the remark sounded perfectly flippant to me but i caught a sudden look of intelligence in gwendolen's eyes and saw that geoffrey had meant something by it in the same moment he saw the bewilderment in mine assuming he explained that the person was still sane he might almost safely have counted on the current carrying the body away altogether and it never being found and if he wanted to dispose of the dress at the same time perhaps that was as good a way to do it as any but he didn't count on the freeze that must have caused him some pretty bad nights i should think and days hardly better it's perfectly extraordinary when you come to think of it that she hasn't been identified you say the pictures were published in the papers everywhere i exclaimed the country's been ringing with it well said geoffrey in the tone of one who dismisses the subject that's very interesting wait a minute exclaimed jack i can show you the picture i cut it out of the paper and laid it away somewhere don't bother exclaimed geoffrey no bother at all jack already had his hand on the door to tell you the truth geoffrey admitted i don't believe i want to look at it let's talk about something else dead faces are beginning to get a little on my nerves oh it's nothing serious he went on seeing the look of surprise on our faces and no doubt it's silly of me to feel that way about it but well i mean it just the same i suppose said madeline that you're loaded up with commissions after your vacation you must have sitters three or four deep clamouring at your studio door i don't know said geoffrey i haven't seen my business man since i came back haven't even been to my studio but i hope to heaven he doesn't get me any more commissions like the last one you knew what that was didn't you he turned to me the thing i was at work on when i bolted i seem to remember said i that you were doing some work for miss meredith the miss meredith questioned madeline geoffrey nodded the same the queer rich invisible miss meredith we all exclaimed over his last word invisible then what were you painting a spirit picture of her the last question was jack's it seemed to affect geoffrey a little unpleasantly for he gave a little shake to his head as one will when a fly is buzzing about one's ear i wasn't doing a portrait of her he explained i was painting from a photograph and a few relics and souvenirs what was meant for a portrait of a niece of hers i think it was a niece who i understand died several years ago i laughed i knew some men did that sort of work it's rather a new line for you isn't it never before said geoffrey and never again of course they offered me a perfectly immoral price for it but even at that i shouldn't have done it except for the fact that i found the photograph they showed me rather attractive beautiful i suppose said madeline that shouldn't be wondered at they say miss meredith was a great beauty in her day yes said geoffrey it was extraordinarily beautiful that wasn't what you meant though commented gwendolen no it wasn't geoffrey admitted there was something about it that was queer i i don't believe i can explain it any better than that and that's not explaining it at all he fell into a little thoughtful silence and we all watched him curiously i'd felt all the evening and i found after he'd gone that the others shared the feeling a sense of difference in him he seemed well again but i felt perfectly sure that the thing he had recovered from cut a good deal deeper than a mere attack of nerves and had a solider cause than the activities of the decorators who were pulling down loose plaster in his studio building whatever that cause was he didn't mean to tell it he brought back with a little effort i would have sworn his old smile and took up the conversation again the queerest thing about it is he said that miss meredith herself never came to see me nor let me come to see her 
i wasn't surprised when the arrangements for the portrait were made by a man who seemed to be a sort of confidential agent of hers as well as her private physician a rather charming chap named crow but when the arrangements were completed and i expressed a wish to talk with miss meredith herself as someone who had known the girl whose portrait i was to paint and could supply me with some of those intimate little details tricks of speech habits of manner and so on that you have to know before you can paint a portrait crow seemed a little embarrassed and said he was afraid it was impossible miss meredith was in a rather disturbed nervous state and couldn't see anybody if i'd ask him the questions or better still write them out he'd undertake to get answers for me i was in two minds about chucking up the whole thing but it seemed miss meredith was very anxious that i paint the portrait and then well i wanted to paint it myself the same troubled thoughtful look came back into his face with that last sentence how did you come out with it i asked i suppose under such a handicap it would be impossible really to satisfy her on the contrary said jeffrey she was greatly pleased with it she came to the studio to see it the day i went away surely you saw her then said jack jeffrey shook his head no said he they made a special arrangement to come and look at it while i was out as a matter of fact i haven't been back to the studio myself since she came and saw it crow called me up at my apartment that evening and congratulated me on having succeeded so well with it he fell silent again after that and said nothing at all for a long time at last with a little sigh and another shake of the head he rose to go i'm quite all right again he assured us you're not to worry about me for he saw plainly enough what we were thinking all i need is work and i imagine there's plenty of that stacked up ahead of me at the studio but after he had got into his overcoat and gloves he stood a moment looking at us thoughtfully hat in hand his other hand on the doorknob you people were faced once with an insoluble contradiction he said slowly a thing that must be true and yet couldn't be true well that's the sort of problem i've been gnawing away at for the last three months a perfect circle you follow it all the way around and bring up where you began i'm going to quit i'm going back to work good night and with a nod he was gone end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two The First Covert. When I walked into my office about half past nine the next morning, I was greeted by my clerk with the information that Geoffrey had been trying to get me and wanted me to call him up as soon as I came in while we were talking the phone rang and madeline called to say that geoffrey had been trying to get me at the house so without stopping to take off my overcoat or hat i called up his studio i heard him unhook the receiver before the bell had stopped ringing and knew he must have been waiting by the instrument for my call the quality of his voice shocked me it was harassed uneven keyed up clear to the breaking point with unnatural excitement i'm awful sorry to trouble you old man he said it's a shame to break up your work right at the beginning of the day but i guess you'll have to come to the rescue what's the matter i asked do you mind coming i can't leave here for an hour or two and i simply can't talk over the phone i'll be in the subway in three minutes said i hold hard till i get there with that i hung up told my clerk i probably shouldn't be back that morning and started up town i'd have been wise i suppose to put a brief in my pocket to read on the way up something to keep me from speculating and worrying about jeffrey's case until i had some data to go on but i doubt if anything could have kept my mind off him jeffrey wasn't one of my oldest friends not one of that little group of people all of us carry along 
in diminishing numbers through life from boyhood people whose circumstances and relations we know almost instinctively people whose world we were born a part of friends of this class we are apt to think we know all about and as far as externals go we do really we are likely to know very little indeed about their interior qualities their soul machinery and we live along side by side with them for years in a state of partial or sometimes total misunderstanding the friendship between geoffrey and me was the other sort we were both grown-up men when we first laid eyes on each other and the thing that made our friendship was a sort of instinctive sympathy a mutual ability to understand each other that had carried us across all the preliminaries of mere acquaintance in one jump the result of this was that so far as externals went we knew relatively little about each other it had never seemed worth while to stop to tell when there were so many more important and interesting things to talk about geoffrey i was sure couldn't have furnished a would-be biographer with any connected account of my experience previous to our meeting three or four years ago and i was in the same case with him i knew he was a brilliantly successful portrait painter i knew in a fragmentary way that as a very young man he had supported himself as a newspaper artist i knew he had a perfectly enormous list of casual acquaintances people from every walk of life way down to the very lowest stratum of the underworld i have described him heretofore as a man of pure genius a man who relied further than anyone else i have ever known on a queer set of intuitions that seemed to begin where ordinary logical processes of thought left off he claimed you may remember a special extra sense for crime said he could detect crime on a man's soul as easily as i could detect whiskey on his breath it was a perfectly unbelievable claim of course and i should have treated it as fanciful except for the uncanny demonstration of it which he had given in our own mystery the mystery of dr marshall and the whispering man geoffrey had solved that and had done it so far as any of us could see by the exercise of this same sheer intuition which he claimed either by that or by the blindest luck in the world and in doing so he had saved gwendolen's life in a word i knew the man himself as intimately perhaps as i knew any one in the world except madeline but about his history i knew nothing i couldn't even have sworn that he had no brothers or sisters though i had never heard of any a perfect stranger might have come up to me and told me any sort of weird or tragic adventures as having belonged to geoffrey's past somewhere and i couldn't have contradicted him i did know this though he was the sort of person adventures happen to imaginative possessed occasionally by powerful impulses full of that strange quality we call for lack of a better word temperament given the right combination of circumstances and the right incentive and geoffrey might have done almost anything so i will have to confess that as i rode up town on my way to his studio knowing only that he was in some sudden unexpected difficulty my thoughts ran riot i conjectured a whole chamber of horrors about him terrible hands reaching out of that blank past of his and snatching at him i'd have said when i knocked at his studio door that nothing i could find on the other side of it would surprise me but what i did find did surprise me and to that was nothing nothing out of the ordinary i mean there was no veiled lady in black looming tragically in a dark corner no mysterious communication no spot oh i had been ready for anything of blood on the studio floor simply everything as i had always seen it and geoffrey himself quite his old self smiling apologetically and holding out his hand to me i telephoned you not to come he said but you had already started i was too late i'm dreadfully sorry 
there's nothing the matter nothing that an hour or two won't set right and i really don't need you a bit only if you've got the leisure i'd be awfully glad to have you stay well but what was it i gasped what did you think it was jeffrey didn't answer for a second or two you remember that portrait i was telling you about last night he asked the thing i painted from a photograph for for miss meredith i nodded but jeffrey wasn't looking at me so after a moment of silence i said yes he brought himself up with a little start well when i came to the studio this morning i found it gone i thought at first that miss meredith might have taken it with her the day she came to the studio to look at it i haven't been back in the place since then you know of course that would have been an awfully funny thing for her to do but she's eccentric they say so i asked my jap boy about it he said no that didn't happen they went away and left it just as it was on the easel so it was perfectly plain that the thing had been stolen it seemed such a queer inexplicable thing for anyone to steal that i was a little bit upset about it so i called on you for first aid as i am afraid i have got the bad habit of doing but afterward i got a clue that suggested a perfectly plain explanation i think i'll have the thing back before noon it's all right you see i'm frightfully ashamed of myself for having troubled you with it still he wasn't looking at me and i stared at his inexpressive back in perfectly blank amazement amazement that had i'll admit a little flavour of indignation in it he had given me a very bad quarter of an hour and his explanation of it seemed absolutely childish was the loss of a portrait a thing that couldn't mean more than two weeks work to his facile brush an adequate explanation for that broken cry of distress i had heard over the telephone the thing was preposterous then i remembered his manner at the house last night the little shiver with which he had spoken of dead faces and how they were getting on his nerves the impatient jerk of his head that had accompanied jack's jocular remark about a spirit portrait and last of all the thing he had said just as he was going out the door about the irreconcilable contradiction that had been confronting him for months the thing that must be true yet couldn't be true after all the thing that gave me the privilege of being called his friend was my ability to understand and make allowances somehow or other he had had a bad quarter of an hour himself that morning perhaps in some queer way i couldn't guess at the discovery of his loss had brought up the old contradiction to stare him in the face had given him a moment of almost superstitious panic which now that a rational explanation had suggested itself as an alternative he didn't feel like acknowledging the existence of even to me i went over to him and laid a hand on his shoulder all right i said let's find it i'm sure i haven't anything better to do and if there turns out to be anything else you want to tell me about it later why you can tell it and be sure that i shall try to understand come let's get down to business what is your clue it's almost childishly simple said jeffrey i'm ashamed of myself that i didn't think of it the moment i discovered the loss instead of blowing up that way why you'll think of it yourself in a minute and here's your chance he added as a knock at the door interrupted us his jap was out somewhere so jeffrey answered it himself how do you do mr peterson he said and ushered the stranger in peterson was a clumsy-looking man of the skilled mechanic type warmly and comfortably and properly dressed enough but his clothes looking as if he were in the habit of getting down on his hands and knees and carrying heavy objects around in his pockets mr peterson said jeffrey is the decorator who did over the building last fall then he astonished me by turning to peterson and saying i'm thinking of having a little more work done oh this is perfectly satisfactory and i wouldn't think of calling in the landlord it's on my own account entirely 
don't you think yourself drew he turned to me that the walls would compose into better-looking panels if we had a second frieze carried around there about a third of the way down i don't know anything about art or composition said i you certainly know that you will have to decide that for yourself it was too ridiculous here was jeffrey who had run away for a two months vacation because the decorators got on his nerves deliberately invoking them again when he got back naturally enough peterson favoured the project that's very well done said jeffrey the upper frieze it's very skilled work you know has to be done by hand then he turned back to peterson i'd want the same man to do it that did the other peterson shook his head i can't accommodate you there i'm afraid sir i had to turn that fellow off oh he was a good workman but rules are rules he came on the job drunk i suppose said jeffrey no said peterson he was steady enough why i don't mind telling you though it seems rather hard i turned him off because his wages were garnished by a loan office you can't get skilled work out of men with that on their minds i see said jeffrey but you think you could find me someone else just as good oh yes said peterson no trouble about that well said jeffrey i'll let you know call you up in the morning when i've made up my mind thank you very much for coming peterson had opened the door and was in the act of starting out jeffrey watching him absent-mindedly a frown on his face poor devil he said under his breath then suddenly struck with an idea he called out oh peterson give me that chap's address will you the one you discharged i'm supposed to belong to some sort of protective league for that loan shark business maybe we could do something to help him out peterson hesitated a minute then took a shabby notebook out of his pocket and read out the name and the address of the man he had discharged Geoffrey wrote it in charcoal on the back of a stretcher. "'All right,' he said. "'You'll hear from me in the morning.' Geoffrey shut the door, and the next minute he was struggling into his overcoat. "'Come along,' said he. "'Where?' I asked. He looked at me queerly. "'Why, to look up the case of this lone shark victim, of course. No time like the present. Come along.' In another three minutes we were in a taxi— Jeffrey's manners were always excellent, but he had a way of letting you know when he didn't want to talk. The address was way uptown on the east side, and our taxi stopped at last in front of a dingy brick house, one of a long row, on a shabby cross-town street. Just as we were going to ring the bell, the door opened and a man started out. He eyed us with a quick little glance of morose, surly suspicion. "'Oh, Mr. Sheen,' said Geoffrey, pleasantly. "'Glad we didn't miss you. Come back in here a minute. I want to talk to you.' If we had asked him if his name was Sheen, I think he'd have denied it and gone on. But there was a mixture of authority and confidence behind Geoffrey's good-natured smile that was almost irresistible. The man hesitated, and having done that much, seemed to find it impossible to do anything but obey Geoffrey's gesture and follow us into the badly lighted, ill-smelling hall. Here Geoffrey stepped back and nodded to him to lead the way. "'What do you want?' Sheen demanded. "'A chance to talk to you for a moment without interruption,' said Geoffrey pleasantly. The man grunted and led the way to a small room at the back of the house. Geoffrey, the last one into it, closed the door after him and nodded toward a chair. "'Sit down a minute,' he said. He waited till Sheen had obeyed him, and I, rather cautiously, had followed suit. I didn't like the man's looks altogether. Geoffrey leaned back comfortably against the top of a trunk. "'We work at the same trade,' he said politely. "'I'm a painter myself. My name's Arthur Geoffrey and I've got a studio up on Central Park West. The man started out of his chair, and then let himself drop back into it. Well, he said savagely, what do you want? 
oh it's nothing to get excited about said jeffrey i suppose you got twenty-five or thirty dollars for the frame you probably needed that more than i do but i need the picture that was in it more than you do so i want you to give it back to me sheen was on his feet by now and the blustering furtive terror in his face and in his voice when he spoke were confession enough to me that my friend's shot had rung the bell you're a liar said sheen a damned liar you don't know what you're talking about i'm talking said Geoffrey, about a picture of a girl in a white satin gown it was in my studio in a french hand carved frame you were at work painting that frieze in my studio you know what that frame was worth and where you could sell it you knew i was off on a two months vacation and you absolutely had to have the money lord man i know what that means myself i never took that means of getting it but i can understand how a man would but you couldn't sell the picture that's preposterous and i want you to give it back to me sheen was staring at him fascinated there was a long silence finally he spoke through his locked teeth i didn't take any picture i swear to god i didn't take any picture the frame was empty when i saw it in there i did take the frame and i sold it i got eighteen dollars for it and i knew it was worth a hundred and twenty eighteen dollars to give to those damned leeches that are sucking all the blood out of me you can prosecute and be damned i wish you would but i didn't take any picture for a full minute i think it must have been jeffrey sat there on the trunk staring at him without a word in his eyes a look almost of panic then he rose and held out his hand to sheen thank you for telling me the truth about it he said oh yes i know it's true i'm sorry for you if you'll come up to my place and see me some day oh any time we'll talk things over and see what we can do oh and if you know where the frame is find out what i can buy it back for will you no i don't want any thanks good-bye in two minutes we were back in the taxi i wanted to ask him what had given him the clue for what seemed to me an uncannily lucky guess but his manner made it plain he didn't want to talk so i left his moody reverie undisturbed all the way back to the studio he sprang out when we arrived there with unconcealed haste and fretted over the slowness of the elevator as we were going up his jap heard us coming and was holding the door open for us togo said jeffrey did you take that portrait i left when i went away out of the frame togo nodded and smiled yes i took out put there he nodded toward a big unframed stretcher on the outside of the stack that was leaning against the wall that it he concluded jeffrey burst into a laugh well why the devil didn't you say so he demanded when i was making all that fuss this morning togo shook his head and lifted his eyebrows frame gone he said i not know Geoffrey strode across the room and swung the big stretcher around then he made a queer noise in his throat there was no portrait there it was just a big gray blank canvas without a brush full of paint on it we looked through the others in the stack we looked at every canvas in the studio but the portrait of the girl in the white satin gown wasn't there End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of The Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Unseen Visitor. Jeffrey's part of the search was a mere pretense. Togo and I looked everywhere down in the studio and up in the loft but for the greater part of the time jeffrey sat in his chair staring dully out of the window and getting whiter and whiter every minute when i had satisfied myself that we had really exhausted the possibilities and that the portrait of the girl in the white satin gown was really nowhere in the studio i dismissed togo with a nod
went up behind Jeffrey and laid my hand on his shoulder. I didn't intend to take him by surprise. He'd have heard me coming, had he not been sunk so far in the very deepest abstraction. As it was, he gave a little shudder under my touch and fainted dead away. I laid him on the floor and loosened his collar, but finally I had to get some cold water and dash it in his face in order to bring him to. Then I gathered him up, and with a little help from himself, got him safely ensconced in his big deep Morris chair. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself, he said limply. I don't know why it is that people apologize for fainting, but they always do. Forget about it, said I. You were in worse shape than I realized when you went away two months ago. If I'd known how bad you were, I think I'd have gone with you. And you're not quite right yet. Madeline and I will figure out, in a little while, what's best for you to do. In the meantime, you stop worrying. As I said, forget it. Jeffrey laughed. It wasn't a pleasant laugh to hear. Forget it, he echoed stop worrying or else said i struck with a new idea tell me all about it i imagine that will be better after all it's nothing but a nightmare said geoffrey that's all it can possibly be exactly i said and the only way to wake yourself out of a nightmare is to bring it out in the daylight reduce it to cold facts tell it no matter how it sounds I've none of your imagination, nor any of those wonderful intuitions of yours, but I do lay claim to a certain amount of common sense, and perhaps I may be able to help you. Will you promise, Geoffrey asked, to believe what I tell you? Oh, I don't mean to ask you not to think me a deliberate liar, he went on, interpreting my look of surprise at his request. I mean... Will you promise to regard me as a sane person recounting observed facts? Promise, when I have got through, not to come over and pat me on the back and tell me what I need as hypophosphites and strychnine. I'm not a wobbly, neurasthenic suffering from hallucinations. If my story sounds like a bunch of phonograph records from Bedlam, you're to promise to believe it's the story's fault, not mine." If I felt an uncanny sort of excitement over his prologue, I did my best not to show it. I loaded and lighted my pipe, pretty deliberately, before I answered, and if the hand that held the match shook a little, I hoped he wouldn't notice it. All right, said I. Fire away. Do you remember, he began, that two years ago I spent the winter in Paris? remember i exclaimed didn't madeline and i visit you a whole week in your apartment there did either you or madeline notice anything queer about me then or did anything happen that you wondered about i hesitated a little over my answer i might as well have spoken out for he noticed the little change in my manner instantly i see you did why really it was nothing said i you may remember the incident yourself we all came into the studio together one afternoon after a little sightseeing expedition and we saw lying in the middle of the floor a woman's handkerchief both madeline and i naturally supposed it was hers i went over toward it to pick it up but you saw it just then picked it up yourself glanced at it and slipped it in your pocket it struck us both as a little queer not what you did, but the way you did it, as if somehow you didn't want to be questioned. Evidently you knew the handkerchief wasn't Madeline's, and you seemed a little embarrassed at finding it there. We'd all been off together, so that whoever dropped it must have been there in the studio while we were out. I stopped there rather awkwardly, but Geoffrey, with a little movement of impatience, told me to go on. What did you think about it? he asked. How did you explain it? Oh, if I'm going to be frank, you must be. Why, we both remembered, 
said i feeling for my words a little lamely that you hadn't originally planned to go with us that afternoon so it seemed to us that the owner of the handkerchief must have come in well must have been enough at home there to get in when there was no one there to receive her and waited for you a while and then gone away and you made i suppose the conventional explanation said jeffrey certainly you couldn't have been expected to make any other especially when i put the handkerchief in my pocket that way and seemed not to want to talk about it but it wasn't the right explanation drew i'm not a puritan said i but somehow i'm glad to hear that we both felt a little uncomfortable about it though we've never discussed it since your manner seemed a little different after it too i suppose that was because you guessed what we must be thinking no said jeffrey i never thought of it that way until this morning but i'll have to go back and begin at the beginning you know i thought i was awfully lucky to get that studio in the first place there isn't a better one in paris the man who had it he's a prosperous well-known painter had a long lease on it and a lot of work to do and it never occurred to me when i asked him if he knew where i could get a studio that there was any possibility of his giving up his but he offered it to me in a hesitating sort of way saying that he meant to find another and thought he could get one the other side of the impasse i asked him why in the world he was moving out of that one to go into one not so good across the street and all he said at first was that he'd taken a dislike to it it had got on his nerves and he couldn't paint there i wanted to know what had got on his nerves and he wouldn't tell me i wouldn't offer it to anyone else he said at last but you're such a sensible chap that maybe you won't mind mind what i asked him again but still he wouldn't tell me it's ten to one a hundred to one there won't be anything that was all he would say he was a cranky temperamental sort of cuss so i didn't think any more about it blessed my good luck and moved in i didn't find anything for about a week and then i asked i tried to say the words casually but it wasn't easy get the geography of the place well in your mind first he said you remember there was a little hall with a kitchenette to the right of it and then the salon and two bedrooms straight along in a row with a corridor on the inside when you get to the end of the corridor you turn to the left and come out in the loft of the studio the studio floor is a half story down by a flight of steps there is a door at the other end of the studio that is reached by a flight of iron steps outside so that models and such can come straight to the studio through the court without coming into the apartment yes said i i've got it straight i remembered it pretty well anyway go on and you understand don't you he continued that there's another apartment and studio on the other side of the court exactly corresponding to mine only left-handed the end walls of the studios come together and the same flight of iron stairs serves both studio doors that's clear isn't it i nodded go on said i what did you find at the end of a week jeffrey shrugged his shoulders nothing he said nothing that i can tell about even to you without feeling rather an ass why i came in just about four o'clock one afternoon in november it was dark of course let myself in by the apartment door not the studio door you understand let myself in with my latch-key and lit the gas in the hall the minute i did it i knew that someone else had just been there i knew that whoever it was was in the next room the salon mind you i didn't see anything nor hear anything i just knew it no there's nothing uncanny about that i've got some sort of extra sense that often tells me those things when the people in question are just ordinary everyday living people i call it an extra sense perhaps it's actually only an abnormal sense of smell but too subtle to be recognized as such as you know i didn't keep any servant that winter i had an old femme de menage who came every morning to clean up and then went away 
she hadn't any business there in the afternoon but still she could have got in she had a key and she might perfectly well have come back when she thought i'd be out oh to steal a few candles or a basket of coal or something they all do that so it didn't startle me at all or give me any queer sensations to know that there was someone in the place i took off my hat and overcoat after i'd lighted the gas and went into the salon well there was no one there but the same sense told me that whoever it was had gone on into the adjoining room that seemed queer because i ought to have heard her moving about but i struck another match and went on there was no one there either but i followed what i can only call the scent which was just as definite real a thing as what a hound follows the trail by out into the corridor and down to the turning and into the loft and down across the studio to the outside studio door and i was just as sure when i got to that door that someone had gone out of it less than half a minute before as i was when i came in that there was someone there you heard nothing all the while i asked not a sound he said except the noise i was making myself and that wasn't much and you saw nothing no said geoffrey well i suppose you will think he was right about it that it did sound silly that it was a confession even a nervous fidgety woman would have been almost ashamed to make and you may think that if i had been the common-sense level-headed friend i professed to be i should have told him that his experience was nothing more than an attack of the creeps and that he was a fool to think twice about it i'd have done that if i could but the fact was i couldn't to begin with i knew that what geoffrey said about his possession of an extra sense was the sober literal truth i would trust that sense of his as far as i would trust one of the regular five senses in a normal man when he said he knew in that inexplicable way that someone was in the salon when he opened the hall door it meant as much to me as if another had said i saw someone standing there granting that and i had to grant it the thing became a very curious mystery you didn't miss anything i asked nothing had been taken geoffrey shook his head the trouble is he went on with the possession of a sense like that you never can really believe in yourself you may know you have it you may be utterly unable to disbelieve you have it but your common sense won't accept an unsupported report of it it insists on telling you that you are a fool with a head full of fancies and it not only prevents you from telling other people about it it won't let you take ordinary common sense means for solving the mystery i thought about the thing for a week it didn't happen again in that time and i had about persuaded myself there was nothing to it but imagination then one evening when i was coming home from the restaurant where i dined i saw a light in my studio my first thought was to go straight up to the studio door by the iron stair then i recollected that the sound of anyone coming up that stair was perfectly audible in the studio from the moment you set foot on the lower step it was a spiral stair and you couldn't go up very fast whoever was in the studio would have ample warning i was coming and plenty of time to get out through the apartment while i was letting myself in the other way so i went up the other stairs as softly as i could had my key ready flung the door open and rushed down the corridor to the loft as i turned the corner i heard the studio door shut the studio was dark when i got into it but one of the candles had just been put out i could smell it i scrambled up on the back of a big breton settle from which i could see out of the studio light into the court i am perfectly sure that i was up there looking out of the window before anyone who had just shut my studio door could have had time to get down the iron stairs and across the court there wasn't any other way out the court wasn't dark for the two hallways were well lighted and there was another bright light in the arched entrance to the court from the street 
well i looked and looked but that court was deserted End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: What Jeffrey Saw. I didn't wait for anything more. I went straight out and questioned the concierge, asked him if anyone had come in inquiring for me, or if anyone had just gone out. He said no to both questions. Well, I said someone has been in my studio there was a light burning when i came in the imbecile asked me if i hadn't left the light there myself i said no that i had gone away at noon and besides the light was out when i got to the studio then he said possibly what monsieur saw was a reflection i told him a reflection didn't leave a smell of hot tallow behind it at that he shrugged his shoulders and suggested i report my losses to the police i don't know that i've lost anything said i and at that he gave me up for a maniac i went back to the studio and found that i hadn't lost anything nothing had even been disturbed but i felt perfectly sure i can't tell you how that somebody had been sitting in my big chair probably for a good while it was clear i'd have to solve the mystery for myself if i made any complaint or tried to provoke an official investigation i'd probably bring up in the madhouse look here geoffrey i cried what about the other apartment the one that corresponded to yours on the other side of the court didn't you say that the end walls of the two studios came together couldn't she have gone couldn't who said geoffrey she the woman that was in your studio the ghost girl whatever she was that's queer said geoffrey i haven't told you that i thought she was a woman a young woman too but i always thought of her that way even then i even called her the ghost girl then there's nothing queer about it said i the handkerchief made me think of a young woman Geoffrey gave a short laugh. That shows what a fool I am, said he. I was getting ready to build another little ghost story out of that. Go on. What were you going to ask? You said the same iron stairs served both studio doors. Well, then, why couldn't she have slipped out of your door and into the other one? There'd be time enough for that. Because I thought of that, said Geoffrey almost at once and i suppose that's the explanation that you'll stick to when i've told you everything although i don't believe it one single minute myself the people who occupied that apartment were an english family named williamson i don't know so very much about him so far as his life is concerned but we were very pleasant acquaintances i met him as soon as i took the studio they are the most commonplace people in the world williamson himself is a retired english doctor a chap in his fifties hard-headed straightforward thoroughly good sort he had a wife and daughter there with him they were living in paris so she could study art she had about as much chance of doing anything at it as a dog has to learn to sing she was a pleasant hard-headed young little old maid of about twenty she worked very industriously in her studio and i developed my talent for fiction to the last notch thinking up things to say about her work when she showed it to me well those three williamsons were simply out of the question that night that i saw the light in my studio there was a light in theirs they generally spent their evenings there i went straight over told them someone had been rummaging around my diggings and asked if they had heard anything through the wall they were interested of course and mrs williamson got quite excited over the idea of robbers and wanted to know if i had lost anything they had been in their studio all the evening now you can say it might have been one of them and i can't prove that it wasn't but all the same the notion is inconceivable i agree with you 
said i go on what happened next there wasn't anything very different up to the time you and madeline came to visit me said jeffrey two or three other experiences more or less like the one i have told you about one night when i was in bed i don't know whether i was asleep or not i wasn't sleeping well then but i waked up if i had been asleep with the idea that i had seen someone go by my bedroom door i wasted two or three minutes i'll admit lying still in a sweating terror trying to convince myself it had been a dream and then i heard the studio door shut i got up and lighted all the lights and looked around but i didn't find anything the whole thing may have been a dream but the handkerchief we found on the floor wasn't a dream and i'm sure it had been dropped while we were out that was the first tangible clue i got the first thing that i couldn't reason away on the theory of imagination when i was in good form I went up one night to call on the man who'd rented me the studio in the hopes of finding out what his experiences had been, but he was mum as an oyster and tried to pump me. Williamson spoke of it again once and asked me if I'd seen or heard anything more, and I told him no. I didn't feel like showing him what an ass I was, and I knew I couldn't start talking about it without giving away the whole thing. It's awfully queer, of course. I said dubiously, but I haven't begun the story yet, said Jeffrey. The real story. But here's where it begins. Now, listen, and if you want to call in an alienist when I get through, why, go ahead. But let me tell the thing connectedly first. A couple of weeks after you and Madeline left Paris, I got a note from the Muirheads, suggesting that I pack up my color box and come down to Atapo for a few days. They were having a lovely time painting winter skies and things, and they wanted to let me in on it. I was glad of an excuse to get away, so I went. I did those sketches I showed you, the only real work I've got to show for the whole rotten winter, and went back to Paris feeling that I'd got rid of the cobwebs. I reached the studio about two in the afternoon, a bright clear day, I was feeling as well, as little liable to any imaginative delusions, as it is possible to imagine any one. I went into my apartment, got rid of my traps, and went down into the studio. Now this is what I saw. One of my easels had been drawn out into the middle of the room. There was a canvas on it that had been painted. There was a low stool in front of it, where the painter had sat. To the left of it was one of my chairs, just an ordinary straight-back chair, with a mirror of mine standing on it, an old mirror in a carved gilt frame, with a sort of ornamental top on it. All around the stool on the floor were brushes and tubes of my colours. There was a palette on the chair, leaning up against the mirror. But the canvas! I asked, for he had hesitated there for a moment. What was on the canvas? Geoffrey got up and drew a long breath. His teeth were clenched as if they wanted to chatter, and he talked through them in a sort of dogged, matter-of-fact way. On the canvas, he said, was a carefully painted portrait of a very beautiful young girl young oh i should say in her middle twenties it must have taken two or three sittings three anyway of pretty fast skilful painting to have carried it as far as it was the last of them must have been that very morning because part of the paint on the canvas was wet it hadn't even dried on the palette the thing was obviously a portrait of the painter the outline of the rim of the palette showed in the lower part of the canvas, but as if held in the right hand, as of course it always is when you sit down in front of the mirror and paint a portrait of yourself. She had even indicated the frame of the mirror on the canvas. It was all perfectly solid and real. As I said, the thing was well painted, though not brilliantly nor trickily at all an excellent an extraordinarily talented piece of work it wasn't completed in fact part of the canvas wasn't covered at all 
it was one of my canvases a grey one like that blank i turned around just now well you had something tangible to go on at last said i what did you do it was hard to decide what to do said geoffrey i didn't go up in the air at all the fact that i had something tangible was in its way a sort of relief and i still think what i decided was the best thing i could do and that was just to stay there in that studio until something happened i made up my mind not to leave the room for more than thirty seconds until that mysterious painter he stopped and gave a shivering little laugh the ghost girl came back i thought she would come back and that before many hours well i waited spent most of the time smoking staring at the portrait i learned it learned every brush stroke in it i could repaint it now from memory i stayed there for thirty-six hours without leaving the room but once that time i went up to my kitchenette and got a box of biscuits i wasn't gone more than half a minute and everything was just as i had left it when i came back but thirty-six hours later that was at two in the morning my endurance gave out and i lay down on my divan there in the studio for what i thought to be a catnap i'm a light sleeper i didn't think it was possible for anyone to get into that room without waking me instantly i suppose i slept pretty hard when i wakened it was ten o'clock the next morning and the portrait i asked the portrait was gone the mirror the easel the stool were all back in their places even my palette and brushes were back on the table where i'd left them when i started for a topple i hadn't a thing to show no way of proving to anybody except myself that i hadn't dreamed the whole thing thank god i could prove it to myself the colours that were left on the palette were not the ones that had been on it when i went away that i am ready to swear unless i'm crazy what is your opinion about it do you want to call a taxi and take me up to bellevue you haven't heard it all but perhaps you've heard enough no i want it all said i everything that you can remember every detail no matter how irrelevant it seems to you i rather think said geoffrey that what i've told you is all so far as the paris mystery goes i'm really satisfied that the adventure on the bridge was pure imagination and nothing else in point of fact it might have been a dream never mind said i i want dreams and all why the night before i left paris said geoffrey that was about the middle of march a warm night like spring i hadn't been able to sleep about four o'clock in the morning i dressed and went out wandered around it must have been about five when i brought up on the point royale the air was very thick with mist. I had on a raincoat, I remember, instead of an overcoat, and the steam in that warm air condensed and trickled down as if it had really been raining. It was a lovely sight. There was a fag end of a moon trying to light up in the mist, and it made every smooth, horizontal surface shine like silver. The flat decks of the barges in the river. It was all very restful and still i seemed to have the world to myself for a few minutes but very soon a woman came along stopped and leaned against the rail close beside me i supposed she was someone who had marked me as possible game and had been following along waiting for a good chance to speak to me i was about to move away when i noticed that she seemed perfectly unconscious of my presence i couldn't see her face at all just a shape she was all wrapped up in one of those rainproof cloaks with a hood and the hood pulled up over her head she stayed there a long time staring down at the river and the boats just as i had been doing before she came the funny thing was that her being there made me uncomfortable it was a little bit like a nightmare perhaps it was really a nightmare because i wanted to go away and i couldn't i didn't want to speak to her and yet it seemed that i must presently i heard footsteps and that seemed to break the spell a little 
they were coming from behind me so i turned to look they were a couple of gendarmes tramping along on their route i heard a little movement beside me and turned to look at the girl the sound had attracted her attention too she was looking in my direction but she wasn't looking at me at all just in the direction of the sound and the hood had fallen back from her head and well she was the girl of the portrait the ghost girl and i felt then as if i'd known it was she from the moment i saw her standing there she didn't make a sound but her eyes widened a little as the gendarmes came near and she turned and fled away and vanished in the mist when they came opposite me they slowed down and looked at me a bit curiously and passed on they didn't pay any attention to the girl i suppose the explanation is that i fell asleep there on the bridge and dreamed about the girl as i often did dream about her and that the coming of the gendarmes waked me up well said i let us be thankful for a reasonable explanation where we can get one undoubtedly that is the explanation in this case geoffrey drew a long unsteady breath i wish i could say undoubtedly in that tone of voice about anything drew people can talk all they like about the tortures of the inquisition and so on but the most exquisite torture in the world is a doubt about the validity of your own observations that's the thing that's driving me pretty near crazy i can't trust my own sense any more don't exaggerate i said sharply i don't doubt anything that you have reported to me i can't explain it i'll agree but there is an explanation we may find it out some day or we may never find it out but the thing really happened i'm going to stick to that and i want you to i don't know he said i haven't told you yet i've been afraid to tell you because when i tell you you won't believe any more than i do listen to this dr crow comes around and arranges for me to paint a portrait for miss meredith from a photograph a photograph of a girl who's dead and he takes the photograph out of its paper wrapping and shows it to me and what do you suppose i see there whose face drew guess guess whose face that was i stared at him and my own dry throat could hardly utter the question the wild fantastic question his words suggested not not i whispered he nodded the same face the very same face that i had seen on the bridge that i'd found painted during my absence there in my studio the face that had been reflected in my old mirror while the sitter herself painted it he stood up and thrust out his hands at me with a kind of feverish energy do you believe me now haven't you any misgivings yourself haven't you got right now in the back of your head the idea that you'll run around and talk to pritchard or foster or some other of those big nerve and insanity specialists that shot of his came uncannily near the mark but i thrust the misgiving out of my mind as soon as it showed itself there not a bit of it said i but you will be a patient for one of those fellows if you let yourself go like this look here you painted the portrait from that photograph didn't you you could see straight enough to put it on canvas and to satisfy miss meredith with the result oh my eyes and hands are all right said geoffrey if there's a kink anywhere it's farther inside than that you say it was miss meredith's niece you painted a portrait of how recent was the photograph geoffrey gave a laugh that was half a shiver well that's the last question he said that brings out the whole tale the photograph drew was taken in paris four years ago it was three years ago that the girl died she died in paris of smallpox during the epidemic three years ago and well you can verify the other date yourself it was two years ago that you and madeline visited paris wasn't it you're quite sure of that there was a ring at the door just then and we heard togo the jap admitting someone into the ante-room
End of chapter 4「Five of the Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five The Jade Earring. When Togo opened the studio door, Geoffrey summoned him in with a nod and with a gesture, told him to shut the door after him. I can't see anybody today, he said there's no telling what sort of a fool i'll make of myself then he turned to togo who is it togo he dr crow said togo he come one time before this morning you out he wait go away come back here now i won't see him said geoffrey that's all there is about it if he's already been here once said i he's probably got something important to say and if togo sends him away he'll come back a little later look here said geoffrey you see him yourself find out what he wants if he asks to see the picture you can tell him you don't know where it is tell him i've been having trouble with the frame anything you like but get rid of him for two or three days if you're right about it if i'm not crazy if the picture's just been stolen in an ordinary human way and from ordinary human motives we can probably get it back maybe we shan't have to let the old lady know it ever was lost anyhow tell him some cock and bull story that will keep him quiet for a while while you're doing that i'll go down and see my friend richards of police headquarters i thought you hadn't much opinion of the police when it came to detective work said i no more i have was geoffrey's answer but an ordinary theft doesn't call for detective work the police know who the thieves are they know the fences and what particular sort of fence makes a specialty of a particular sort of stolen property and if it's a case where they are really interested they go and get it and bring it back i've done richards many a good turn before now in my old newspaper days and i've an idea he'll do what he can for me he was struggling into his overcoat before he had finished speaking and at the end he moved toward the door that led out into the corridor on reaching the door he stopped impulsively and came back to me i don't know old man he said whether you're the greatest liar in the world or not but you're a good samaritan anyway if you'd taken my story the way anybody could have been expected to take it and if you'd said any of the ordinary so-called comforting things about nerves and overwork and so on i don't know what i'd have done i haven't done much yet said i but it's my affair now as much as it is yours we'll see it out together he caught my hand in a grip that fairly hurt. "'Stay here till I come back,' he said, as he turned again toward the door. "'I'll ring when I come, and find out from Togo if the doctor's gone. If he hasn't, I'll wait in the ante-room. You show him out this way.' "'All right,' said I, and the next moment I heard his footsteps echoing down the hall." it wasn't until i directed togo to show dr crow into the study that i realized i had no excuse to give for being there or for asking his business on geoffrey's behalf but a lawyer is always in need of explanations for things and i have found an excellent expedient when all others fail in telling the simple truth it's apt to be quite as misleading provided you really want to mislead anybody as the most ingenious fiction dr crow came in in a quick eager sort of way looked around the room for geoffrey and then seeing that i was the only person there stopped hesitated and then spoke in a tone obviously puzzled i i want to speak to mr geoffrey he said i understood his man to tell me he was here indeed i thought i heard his voice he was here said i he went out only this moment 
that singular said the doctor didn't his man say i wanted to see him yes said i but i'd noticed before that he seemed rather upset and on hearing that he had another visitor he said abruptly that he could see no one asked me to stay and see you and bolted i suppose his parting injunction entitles me to ask if i can be of any service to you i'll try to do anything you ask me to except explain mr jeffrey's departure i'm afraid that's beyond me while i talked i was recalling to mind jeffrey's description of the man that he had given us the night before the rather charming young doctor who had arranged for the portrait between him and miss meredith he fully justified jeffrey's adjective a good-looking young chap dark slender very bright-eyed his smile came quickly when he wanted it almost too quickly so that it reminded me a little of switching on the electric light the advantage of being an artist he said amiably is that one doesn't have to explain things like that temperament will cover anything in the case of as gifted a man as jeffrey anything he could possibly take it into his head to do illogically enough i resented this a little and felt an inclination to justify my friend's action by taking my caller much more fully into our confidence than i had intended to do what stopped me was the idea that perhaps this was exactly what the doctor had intended i'm afraid i shan't be much good as a substitute said i why said the doctor it is possible that you'll do better than the man himself you don't mind my asking a few questions not a bit said i i'll answer anything i can sit down won't you he didn't take the chair i indicated but walked across the room and drew up another one i took it that the manoeuvre was executed to give him a better chance to look around the studio possibly to see whether the portrait of the girl in the satin gown was in sight anywhere i am a substitute myself he said when he was settled in the chair he had selected jeffrey painted a portrait for a client or patient or relative of mine i don't know just which to say since she comes under all three categories miss meredith i didn't know you were related to her i observed he shot a quick look at me i see you know about her already said he all the better i'm not a relative in any strict sense he went on a sort of half-nephew by marriage perhaps we're all so mixed up that it is difficult to keep such matters straight however it's a close enough family connection to justify me in going rather outside of the strict duties of a medical practitioner justify i questioned why in the main he said i hold that a doctor should be a doctor to his patients and nothing else the relation if extended beyond that is liable to abuse but miss meredith's case is peculiar she is an old lady frail nervous quite alone in the world for all her family has been a numerous one she's entirely unable to meet the various business and social demands that are made on a person of her wealth and position i am able to get on with her better than most people and so it has happened that i have given up my practice and devoted myself exclusively to her affairs he said it all in a very straightforward fashion his frankness seemed almost to admit the existence of a mercenary motive in what he had done for certainly he was speaking of her with no pretense of affection but one was inclined to say after all why not the only thing that i didn't like was his telling it to me he made such a parade of candour that i distrusted him a little he laughed if i could have spoken my thoughts aloud he couldn't have read them more accurately than he did you're wondering why i should tell you all this he said 
well it's a necessary preliminary to some questions i'm going to ask you know who it was that mr jeffrey painted the portrait of miss meredith's niece i think he said he nodded and did mr jeffrey inform you also that he accepted miss meredith's commission without seeing her that he has in fact never seen her yes said i he told me that too it must have struck him as a very curious arrangement the doctor went on really it was by my advice that the thing was done that way as i said miss meredith is a very nervous woman and the death of her niece seems to have caused her a serious shock they were in paris together three years ago when the girl died that would accentuate the shock of course said i being alone with her in a foreign country they were travelling about together i suppose no as a matter of fact said the doctor they were living in paris miss meredith prefers the continent to this country and claire was i believe studying art i couldn't help the catch in my breath that came just then i was quick enough to choke the exclamation of astonishment that was on my lips i experienced for a moment the same sensation that must have been jeffrey's constant companion during the past two months and i didn't wonder at the look of panic that sometimes came into his eyes the doctor wasn't looking at me and i was glad of it that was three years ago you say i tried to make the question sound casual enough but i don't know how well i succeeded he nodded she died of smallpox during the epidemic of that year he said miss meredith never got over the shock of it the girl is very constantly in her thoughts and she wanted a portrait that should be a more living memorial than the one photograph which she possessed but you will understand i think that it was impossible in her condition to talk calmly about the girl to a stranger to tell him in detail facts about her appearance such as mr jeffrey wanted so i had to undertake to convey them to him at second hand it is really marvellous that under such a handicap he succeeded so well he told me that miss meredith had apparently found it satisfactory said i the doctor laughed satisfactory isn't precisely the word i should use said he it doesn't cover the ground at all in fact the portrait was so vivid and poignant a reminder of claire herself that the sight of it the day when she came here to the studio upset her dreadfully she looked forward to getting final possession of it with a mixture of anxiety and dread in fact the memory of it has possessed her imagination ever since in a way that i as her physician am forced to regret the portrait then said i is more like the original than the photograph from which it was painted the doctor nodded strikingly so said he again i had to draw in a long slow breath to steady myself but when i had done that i managed to say indifferently enough oh well the ways of genius are past finding out mr jeffrey's genius as a portrait painter seems to lie in getting beneath the surfaces of things and presenting the living reality if he can do that with a living face which is often inexpressive enough to the ordinary eye of the character beneath it it is not so wonderful that he should do it to a less extent of course with a momentary record of a face as it appears in a photograph it's a great test of his powers though such a wonderful compliment to them the doctor nodded thoughtfully and there was a little silence before he spoke again mr jeffrey lived in paris for some time didn't he oh years ago said i long before i knew him of course like every painter he goes back occasionally for visits i suppose he's been back there within the last four or five years oh yes said i the doctor let another moment go by in silence 
i'm going to be frank with you he said at last and i hope you will be frank with me i hope what i have already told you of my relation with miss meredith is enough to clear me of the charge of idle curiosity miss meredith is far from a well woman she has had the idea ever since she came here to look at mr jeffrey's portrait of her niece that that portrait wasn't painted exclusively from the photograph mr jeffrey must have seen and remembered the girl herself and nothing could satisfy her short of my coming to ask mr jeffrey if that had been the case i'm sure said i that jeffrey will be glad to go see her and set her mind at rest in the matter with all the man's easy frankness his almost unnecessary frankness i could not be rid of the feeling that there was something wary about him watchful alert i had had that feeling through the whole of our interview and with his reception of these last words of mine it grew tenfold stronger that won't be necessary said he i'm afraid it wouldn't be advisable she receives no visitors at all in her present condition she is not able to receive them but if you know anything about it one way or another i wish you'd tell me if you don't you can ask jeffrey when you see him and drop me a line i could say this much said i that i am quite sure if jeffrey had been painting from the memory of any living face he had ever seen he would have told me so he hasn't told me so and therefore i conclude that miss meredith is mistaken surely the mistake is natural enough to one in her condition oh yes of course of course he said but there wasn't much conviction in his voice it strikes me as possible though he went on that he might have met her on one of his visits to paris while she was living there or have seen her and been struck by her appearance without learning her name i haven't seen her since she was a little girl but i'm told she grew into a very beautiful woman so that a memory of her might have been evoked by the photograph and could easily have had an effect on the portrait without his knowing it that's ingenious at any rate said i and almost plausible how long had miss claire meredith been living in paris when she died of smallpox not quite two years said the doctor then i'm afraid that disposes of the theory jeffrey was living with me in an apartment on madison square all that time and i know he didn't leave the country there was a little pause he did go to paris two years ago didn't he the doctor said it very indifferently so that it hardly sounded like a question at all but all the same he waited for an answer waited i'd almost have sworn a little breathlessly oh yes said i my wife and i visited him there but that if my dates are right was a year after the young lady died oh yes he said quickly i wasn't thinking of that but he had been thinking of just that i felt sure and unless my imagination was working over time he was paler than he had been when he came in i'm afraid the unconscious memory theory won't work said i that's a pity too because i suppose it would have been a comfort to miss meredith he turned on his smile again rose buttoned his overcoat and shook hands with me i'm just as much obliged to you anyway and we'll fall back on your theory that the ways of genius are past finding out what if he did paint a portrait of a face he'd never seen and improve on the only record of it we've given him after all that's no more mysterious than writing hamlet do you suppose shakespeare believed in ghosts i asked he looked at me steadily for a moment in thoughtful silence everybody believes in ghosts he said everybody he stood near the door his walking stick tucked under his arm while he drew on his gloves but when he had finished and had laid his hand on the knob he stopped short as if he had just remembered something there's something else miss meredith wanted me to ask about he said 
i nearly forgot it yes said i inquiringly i wonder if i mayn't have a look at the portrait i can explain what i mean better that way i'm afraid not i told him i don't know where it is geoffrey said something about some trouble he had had with the frame i don't know whether the canvas is in the studio or not but i don't like to rummage of course not he assented cordially it's a very trifling matter really the pose of the face shows one ear and that is in deep shadow but in the portrait just below the ear there is a streak of bluish-green light miss meredith couldn't account for it and she has been wondering about it ever since it looks as if it were meant for an earring a jade earring perhaps but there was nothing like that in the photograph of course said i nobody could answer a question like that except geoffrey himself but i doubt if there's any mystery about it he probably put it there on the spur of the moment because it helped his harmony or his composition or some other of the tricks of his trade but i'll ask him if you like he has your address of course he can drop you a line when he comes in and tell you all about it the doctor began unbuttoning his coat and fumbling with his gloved hand in one of his inner pockets i wish you would ask him he said but when it comes to letting me know i wish you'd take charge of that yourself i never knew a genius who was a reliable letter-writer he had got out his pocket-book by now and was fishing for a card presently he got one and held it out to me is it too much to ask he concluded just a line telling what geoffrey says about his reason for putting that little green streak into that shadow on his canvas there's my address if you undertake it for me i shall be sure of hearing i'll be very glad to said i good-bye then and thank you the next moment he was gone i stood in my tracks staring thoughtfully at the door he had closed behind him i hoped geoffrey wouldn't come in for a while there was so much to think about and i wanted my thoughts in order before i tried to tell them to him after a while my eyes fell to the rug where dr crow had stood while he was fishing for the card with his address upon it they caught the shine of something half buried in the deep nap of the rug my hands were trembling when i stooped to pick it up it was a long pendant earring of polished jade End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of The Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Believing in Ghosts. But even as I stood there, staring dully at the thing that lay in the palm of my hand and glowed dully back at me, with the impenetrable look of mystery jade always has the door from the reception room opened from behind me i put the hand with the earring into my trousers pocket turned and faced geoffrey did you meet crow i asked he's just this minute gone he shook his head i heard you talking in here as i came by the door so i waited he made you quite a visit had he anything to say oh he wanted to see the portrait said i he said miss meredith was waiting for it with a mixture of anxiety and dread she'll probably have it in a few days said geoffrey richard seems to have no doubt about recovering it he thinks he knows where it is where does he think it is i asked geoffrey shook his head he didn't tell me he asked me a few questions and jumped to a theory of his own i couldn't follow him it's the first time anything like that ever happened to me to be outguessed by a policeman i'm losing my wits i suppose of course i didn't ask him he walked moodily across to his morris chair and dropped into it with an air of utter lassitude and fatigue i hated to begin asking him questions poor geoffrey 
if the inextricable tangle of coincidences in which we were involved already terrified and bewildered him what would his condition be when he heard the rest when i told him the whole story of my conversation with dr crow and when i showed him the thing i had just put in my pocket the thing had to be done however jeffrey said i miss meredith and the doctor were terribly puzzled by that portrait puzzled i nodded jeffrey it's more like the original than the photograph was i expected his eyes to widen at that and his body to grow tense instead he answered indifferently enough what of it it ought to be more like you mean i suppose that any really great artist sees beneath the surface of things depicts an inner truth that inner truth be blowed interrupted jeffrey it's surfaces i'm talking about a photograph of anything but a flat object is never by any possibility correct you can photograph an etching or the page out of a book or a set of working drawings with absolute accuracy but never anything in the round there is only one plane in a photograph that is in true focus everything that comes nearer than that plane is too big everything behind that plane is too small any competent draughtsman can correct a photograph and any competent portrait painter can paint from a photograph a portrait that is more like than the photograph itself his manner nettled me a little all the more because it was so rare with him of course he had some excuse for being irritable to-day and i might have remembered that any sort of culturine talk about art with a big a always made him impatient but he had made it easier than i had expected to speak about the earring all right said i we'll let the inner truth be blowed as far as you like and get down to facts did you do anything beside correcting the drawing in the photograph beside did you paint anything in it that wasn't there did you make up anything and slap it in just to make the picture look better or harmonize or compose better or well for any other reason jeffrey he was looking at me keenly enough now what do you mean he asked what are you talking about dr crow said i expressed some curiosity about a light bluish green streak in the shadow under the ear he wondered if it had been meant to represent an earring say a jade earring jeffrey was on his feet now and his eyes were blazing did he ask that question himself just that way he demanded just that way jeffrey his excitement had infected me now and my question asked itself jerkily jeffrey was there a jade earring in the other portrait the one you found in your studio when you came back from Matabo? he didn't answer for a full minute and all the while his unseeing eyes never left my face all the power of his mind was concentrated in the struggle to reproduce and perfect a memory no he said at last it wasn't in the portrait but i can tell you where it was drew it was in the ear of the girl who stood beside me on the bridge that night at paris what did it look like i asked breathlessly once more he took his time about answering his eyelids narrowed to slits and the contracted pupils were no bigger than pinpoints there was a tiny ring which pierced the lobe of the ear he said and below that a small perfect sphere of jade below that was a long rounded tapering pendant it's as clear to me as if i had it in my hand like this i asked and i took my hand out of my pocket there in my palm lay the thing he had described the moment i uncovered it i regretted having sprung this last mine in so theatrical a fashion had i not been as excited as he i shouldn't have done it because i really feared that the shock of this last could i call it a coincidence 
might do him a serious injury my own brain was reeling with the weird incredible extravagance of it and to me the whole thing came at second hand what would it be to him who had felt the unknown undiscoverable presence in his paris studio who had found the portrait painted there who had seen the photograph of the same face and had learned that it was the face of a girl who was dead a whole year before that ghostly portrait had been painted i stood there for a minute not daring to look at him fearing that there might break any moment on my ears a burst of maniacal laughter but utterly to my astonishment what i did hear was a long deep breath of the most intense relief thank the lord said geoffrey he took the earring from my hand carried it over to the light and subjected it to a minute careful scrutiny i noticed that he was rubbing a finger over its smooth cool surface as if the actual material feeling of it were an intense satisfaction to him then he tucked it into his pocket pulled himself up on a high painting stool and hooked his heels into the rungs he was a new man again rather he was the old man the man he had been before he went to paris and had never been since he gave his head a rueful shake i've had a scare drew the worst i ever had in my life i didn't even dare tell you how bad it was that will have to be my apology for the way i treated you this morning now that it's over i'll try to make amends let's go to lunch richards won't be here for an hour or two then for the first time he seemed to notice the astonishment that had held me speechless but that i am sure must have shown in my face what's the matter with you he asked don't you understand i can understand the scare all right said i but why you should say it is over now is beyond me i was almost afraid to show you that earring i was afraid it might finish you it's pretty near finished me he smiled at me his old amused irrepressible smile man said i the girl was dead and you saw her one might have explained the portrait but it wasn't in the portrait that you saw the earring it was in the ear of the girl herself and she was dead and yet you described the earring in the most minute detail oh come along to lunch said geoffrey i'm hungry as a hod carrier when they blow the whistle i'll tell you all about it across the corner of a square meal and no persuasion of mine could get another word out of him until we were fairly seated in a nearby restaurant and had sent away the waiter with an order that did ample justice to geoffrey's boast about his appetite by the way said geoffrey you haven't told me where you got that earring no said i rather sulkily as long as you have solved the mystery so easily without that information i don't see why you should want it geoffrey smiled again and reached over and patted me on the arm there is some sort of magic in geoffrey's touch in this case it wiped away my resentment as a sponge wipes the writing off a slate crow left it said i left it crow oh quite involuntarily he had his gloves on and he was fishing in his card case for a card with his address on it i had his address said geoffrey his confidence in you as a letter writer is very limited said i and he said he really wanted an explanation of that green streak in the shadow under the ear he relied on me to get it for him the earring must have been in his card case and when he fished out his card he dropped it that's a very soft thick rug and it didn't make any noise crow said geoffrey thoughtfully crow i wonder if he will turn out to be the beginning i wonder if the first step in our mystery lies his way the first step i cried then you haven't solved it solved it said geoffrey i haven't tried to solve it haven't begun to solve it but i protested 
up there in the studio you said you had had a bad scare but it was over yes said jeffrey the scare was over and the mystery begun can't you see what a relief it is to know that it is a mystery what do you suppose it was that i was afraid of that i had seen a ghost why something like that said i i am perfectly willing to see a ghost said jeffrey if i can be convinced that it is a ghost an outside ghost somebody else's ghost as well as mine the thing that terrified me was that i couldn't prove even to myself that it was anything more than a kink in my own mind a bunch of hallucinations and obsessions of my own producing the sort of things that make the alienists rich but now i know that what i saw on the bridge that night in paris was either a live woman or an honest ghost i'm going to find out which it was whichever it was that earring crow was so curious about lets me out no two people ever have exactly the same mania and he is evidently as curious about the thing that wore the earring as i am he or miss meredith said i yes he or the mysterious miss meredith geoffrey assented for the present we'll consider them one person and that one person dr crow now let us try to figure out crow's position this is going to be logic which is your department so you will have to correct me if i go wrong crow gets me to paint a portrait we don't know why he came to me i didn't want to paint it and he insisted the question is had he any reason for insisting beyond the fact that his client was rich and that i was fashionable we have no means of answering that question yet i didn't tell him where my studio was the last time i spent a winter in paris but he might have found it out from someone else and if he knew i cried he might have thought that in that particular place you might see something he might have wanted to try his experiment exactly said geoffrey but we can't build upon that yet that's got to stay in the question column anyhow i paint the portrait and the portrait shows some data which were not contained in the photograph he gave me he looked at me thoughtfully what did he begin on he asked did he begin with the earring no said i he began by trying to find out if you couldn't have met the girl if you hadn't been in paris during the time she was there during the time she lived there geoffrey corrected i nodded you satisfied him that was impossible he asked completely said i it was as perfect an alibi as you ever saw and then geoffrey went on he asked said i if you hadn't been to paris two years ago after the girl had died he commented i pointed that out to him said i but still i thought he held his breath while he waited for my answer so that he evidently thought it possible said geoffrey that i might have seen her after she was dead i wonder if dr crow believes in ghosts he said he did said i what he said that everybody did that would include him i suppose your logic is flawless said geoffrey but how did he come to make that observation it was quite casual said i i happened to say that i wondered if shakespeare believed in them casually oh yes he said something about hamlet that put it in my head i suppose the subject never was very far out i wish i'd seen him said geoffrey why do you make so important a matter of it i asked geoffrey looked at me with a rueful little frown that had half a smile in it because my dear drew said he if dr crow doesn't believe in ghosts then he has got some reason for doubting that claire meredith is really dead he suspects i saw something if he is perfectly sure it couldn't have been a ghost i saw then he must know that it is possible that what i saw was the living woman there was a moment's silence then geoffrey brought his hand down suddenly but softly on the table and then the earrings he whispered crow has the earrings or he had 
till he dropped one of them this morning if it isn't a ghost i saw on the bridge she had the earrings then if crow doesn't believe in ghosts then he has seen the living woman since i did how do you make that out i asked why you idiot he cried how else did he get them from her he has them now she had them then unless she was dead then and buried in a ghost that i saw we'd have taken a long step in our mystery if we could be sure whether dr crow believed in ghosts or not end of chapter six